The delegates to the Constitutional Convention understood that they exceeded their authority. They were supposed to only revise the Articles of Confederation, not replace them. So they had two insurance policies. Number one, we already talked about, George Washington being the Constitutional Convention president. Get his signature and you are you are pretty safe when it comes to that. Uh, but in, in addition to that, we're going to have the ratification uh, requirements. Remember in the Articles of Confederation, it required every single state to vote yes for ratification, whether it be to be included into the, uh, the Articles of Confederation government or to change the Articles of Confederation. The Constitution is different. The Constitution only requires three-fourths of the, of the states to ratify. Uh, still, a very hard thing to do, uh, but it's not impossible like, uh, like it was under the Articles of Confederation. So if three-fourths of the states ratified the Constitution, it would go into effect. Uh, if three-fourths of the states did not, then the Articles of Confederation would still be in effect. So they kind of had like a get-out-of-jail-free card. But nonetheless, after the, co the final copy is signed, the founders brought the Constitution to the Congress. And Congress knew two things. Number one, it went too far uh, when it came to its mandate. And number two, uh, its own powerless to stop it. Uh, they had little d choice but to accept the changes. It also helps that a third of the members uh, of, the co of the Congress were part of the, con the convention. And not to mention the fact that Congress also had a nationalist sentiment as well. But the publication of the, of the Constitution is going to spark a massive debate throughout the United States. And the nation is going to be split between those that favored it and those that didn't. Those that favored federal, the, the Constitution are going to be known as the Federalists. Whereas the those that opposed it are going to be called the anti-federalists. Now the federal the, it's ironic because the federalists, uh, when it comes to their their views, uh, they use the name to deflect charges uh, that they favored an excessive centralization of political authority. The anti-federalists are going to support a state-centered sovereignty, and it's the name is going to be ironic because they were the ones who actually believed in a federalist type of government, of a federal type of government. The Federalists, however, have a massive advantage. Number one, they're they're going for something. You, it's easier to be successful politically if you're for something rather than against something. And the Federalists also are going to have the strongholds. They're going to have the newspapers, the pamphlets, and they're going to have speeches. They're going to be far more organized. Anti-Federalists are going to lack these social uh, connections or these access to the newspapers. Anti-Federalists are going to be basically your rural people living out living outside of the cities uh, and the away from isolated from uh, not, uh, the public knowledge uh, for the most part. The Federalists, however, are going to be occupied the cities. They're going to have the newspapers, and they can be better informed when and or at least know what's going on. Uh, the Federalists were going to believe, they were going, sorry, the Anti-Federalists believed that the Constitution would create a tyrannical republic because it was far too distant and too removed from the interests of common sense, I'm sorry, common citizen farmers. And there's some notables, uh, Elbridge Gary, where we get Gary Man and gerrymandering from, uh, George Mason, we've talked about him, and a man named Edmund Rudolph. The Federalists are also going to use the crises of 1786 to advance their arguments. They especially are going to use the Shays Rebellion uh, as a reason why the Articles of Confederation need to be replaced. So the uh, they're going to use that to great to their advantage. The Federalists are going to move quickly to prevent their opposition from organizing effectively. The Constitution is finalized in September, and the first Constitutional Conventions are going to meet in December. And in December 7th, on December 7, 1787, Delaware is going to meet and decide unanimously for the, uh, for the Constitution. And so Delaware is traditionally called the first state. So if you ever drive through Delaware you're, and you look at their license plates, you can, you'll notice that, they're, uh, that their license plates say the first state. Uh, if you me if remember back at the turn of the 21st century, you also have a statehood quarters. Uh, and the first quarter that's, that comes out in 1999 is Delaware. And they did an order of the states coming into the Union. By January, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut have ratified by large by large margins. Pennsylvania is important because of the fact that it's the largest, it's the first large state to ratify. So by the time we get to January, we already have, let's see here, five of the minimum nine states to ratify. Uh, 
Pennsylvania is also easily, easily goes uh, into the Federalist camp because Philadelphia is a Federalist stronghold. The next month, February, we get Massachusetts, and Massachusetts, uh, and one of the part, and one of the strongest anti-Federalist presence was uh, was John Hancock, and the Federalists would have to use Samuel Adams to to uh to convince John Hancock from uh to support uh the constitution and, and they are going to appeal to Hancock's uh vanity they're going to say look we know that George Washington is going to be president of the United States but Virginia has not ratified the constitution and if it doesn't ratify the constitution who can fill the 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 void who can fill in Washington's shoes as the our first president of the United States and of course Hancock's thinking hey it could be me so you know he has a lot to gain from this so he ultimately switches his vote for to be for the constitution and delivers Massachusetts uh to the federalists uh federalist uh, camp a state that's been a pain in the neck uh, for for a while was Rhode Island. Rhode Island doesn't show up uh, for some conventions, and and uh, and they and they are they are already opposed one time the changing of the Articles of Confederation for a tariff. Well, Rhode Island not only does not have a, uh, ratified the Constitution, it doesn't it, it does it holds it rejects. Uh, having a convention to decide ratification, so it doesn't even so it rejects the convention, much less the ratification of it. Uh, but nonetheless, by April and May, Maryland and South Carolina have ratified. And although we could, we don't, the the, our, the Constitution could be a, could have been ratified without the states in New York and Virginia. Uh, they are crucial. New York is strategically located, and Virginia is the most populous state. But nonetheless, it's in New York that we're going to have some famous uh, deals being made, uh, and we're also going to have um, we're going to have uh, papers known as the Federalist Papers be 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 published. Uh, in, in New York, the Federalists are going to say, you know what, we're going to have a Bill of Rights. You don't like what the, this art Constitution says because it tells you what what doesn't tell you what the limits of this new government's going to be. That fine, we'll do we'll we'll make a Bill of Rights to clearly show where the federal